So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Ha Tian Wang is a William Marsh Rice Trustee Chair and Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, and he joined the university in 2019. At Rice, his research group has been focused on developing novel nanomaterials for energy and environmental applications, including energy storage, chemical and fuel generation, and water treatment. Uh, Dr. Wang has been awarded a 2021 Sloan Fellow, a 2020 Packard Fellow, and a 2019 CIFAR Azraeli Global Scholar. In 2019, he was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 in Science, and in 2021, he was among nine Rice Engineering faculty members ranked among the world's highly cited researchers. This is just in his first three years at Rice, so uh, look forward to uh, following his contributions in the years to come. Uh, Hatian obtained his PhD degree in the Department of Applied Physics at Stanford in 2016 and his Bachelor of Science in Physics at the University of Science and Technology in China in 2011. It was in 2016 that Dr. Wang received the Rowland Fellowship and began his independent research career at Harvard as a principal investigator. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hao Tian Wang. Thank you. Can uh, everyone hear me okay? Um, thank you, Marcy, for your very nice introduction, and thank you, all the way for this uh, nice invitation to give me the opportunity to share with our engineering folks uh, the research that my group over the past several years at Rice are focusing on. Um, so um, look at the title of my talk. It has actually only two terms, right? Electrifying and chemical engineering. Uh, of course, uh, most of us are very, very familiar with um, chemical engineering. And if we're talking about chemical engineering, it's very natural for us to think of uh, a picture like a huge chemical plant like this. And um, it's um, already a century-old topic, a century-old field that has already entered into every corner of our everyday life. So just look around this room. Uh, the plastics we use to decorate our chairs and desks, uh, the electricity lighting up our room, the, the concrete, the steels that support the constructions of this building, as well as the fuels that we burn every day to bring us to rise and then back to home, are all relevant to chemical engineering, right? And while the chemical engineering industry has tremendously supported the, the continuous development, the rapid development of our human uh, society over the last century or so, it is now currently facing a grand challenge that has never faced before, which is the immersive and the, a huge amount of carbon emissions that we produce every year um, that is contributing to the global climate change. I think there is no need for me to spend more time on convincing you that the CO2 emission is directly correlated with climate change. I think Daniel will be a much better position to convince you that this is a very direct correlation. Here I will just list you um, a few critical numbers to give you a rough idea what's the um, carbon emissions that chemical engineering uh, is made um, every year. So annual carbon emission to the atmosphere based on the energy consumptions of the global activity is about 32 gigaton. And out of that, only about 3% that is directly contributed by the manufacturing process of chemicals, which I say directly is means that the fuels and chemicals that we burn for transportation so as not counted into this one gigaton. So it looks like it's only a small fraction of the total emissions, but if we really take a reference about the gigaton, this unit, you will see how massive that is. So take a look at that global concrete production every year for all these buildings, bridges, you know, airports, and so on that we produce, we build every year globally, it's only about four gigaton. So one quarter of that mass is actually the carbon dioxide emissions that we produce, we dump into the atmosphere while we're producing the chemicals. So it's actually a very, very massive unit. And of course, there are a few uh, big players in the chemical engineering uh, industry. For example, the ammonia that contributes almost half of the uh, carbon emissions that contributes nearly 2% of the total energy consumptions globally uh, that helps us to feed the global 7 billion people. Of course, methanol is one of the critical uh, reagents that we use to fabricate chemicals and fuels, as well as acetylene. It's the precursor that we use to fabricate 
polymers, plastics, and so on. And of course, a, another critical player, which is hydrogen, that has been massively produced and utilize a lot of the energy and has been mostly used to produce these downstream uh, uh, chemicals and so on. So while we all agree that decarbonizing this manufacturing of these chemicals is necessary and important to the sustainable development of chemical engineering, then why we propose electrifying? Why is not gasifying, liquefying, other fines? Why electrifying, right? So there are two major reasons behind it that we can um, feel very justified uh, to propose this idea of electrifying. Number one is the continuous decrease of renewable electricity cost over the past several years, as well as the continued increase of the renewable power plant installations globally. So when you take a look at of these solar electricity prices, it's all the case uh, in you know, uh, wind electricity price, nuclear electricity price, uh, and so on, all the renewable electricity price, using solar electricity as example here. Over the past 10 years or so, you see the continuous and dramatic decrease of the electricity cost, uh, about 10 times lower than 10 years ago right now. Uh, and it's continued to decrease, and we will expect that number can reach to two to three cents per kilowatt hour, so nearly another half in the next five to 10 years. And also at the same time, the installations of these power plants, renewable power plants, are continue to rise and compete with the fossil fuel power plants. And about 20 years ago, we own, that share is only 20% or so, but nowadays it's coming to 80 to even 90% in the next five to 10 years. And in the future, you will see dominant uh, installations of power plants capacity expensive, uh, expansion globally will come from renewable sources. And another reason for uh, electrifying chemical engineering is because we can actually utilize electricity to fabricate chemicals and fuels. So using hydrogen as an uh, example here, uh, I think some of us may already be familiar about water splitting where our high school chemistry class may have some experimental demonstrations where you just have two electrodes inserted in water and pass electricity between these two electrodes. And you can actually split water into clean hydrogen and oxygen on the surface of the electrode as clean fuels. And in, during this chemical fabrication process, the only thing that you need is water, of course, that's abundant. You only need electricity. And you don't need any fossil fuels. And if the electricity ultimately comes from renewable sources, the hydrogen we generate will be zero carbon emissions during the fabrication process. And our industrial players has already demonstrated by fabricating massive skills of these electrolyzers, you can bring down the energy, you can bring up the energy efficiency, converting electricity to hydrogen up to 80%, while also maintaining relatively easy operation uh, conditions such as room temperature and ambient pressure. And at the same time, you can deliver very high uh, cost competitiveness, uh, especially when uh, a DOE has a recent target of uh, delivering about $1 per kilogram of hydrogen production using renewables um, in about 10 years. So this can be very, very competitive to the existing market price. And most importantly is due to the simplicity and easy operation and uh, much milder reaction conditions of electrolyzers compared to the traditional huge chemical plants, you can actually deploy these electrolyzers in a decentralized manner where these renewable electricities are produced. And of course, hydrogen is not the only one that we can fabricate using electricity. We can also take CO2, which basically people treat them as waste as well as the troublemaker, and using electricity to dump them, in, uh, to convert them into methanol and ethylene. We can also use electricity to reduce nitrogen, which is the, the most abundant gas molecules in the atmosphere, into ammonia for fertilization. And also we can convert oxygen uh, into hydrogen peroxide. There is a wide, band, a wide range of uh, spectrum that we can fabricate chemicals using electricity from uh, while electrochemical reactions. I think we don't, we don't like uh, chemical equations. We don't like these complicated equations, but I only ask you to focus on the commonalities of these equations is they all use electrons. They all can use renewable electricity 
as the energy input, not fossil fuels, not other reliable sources, uh, not other uh, 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 fossil fuel sources. And also, the chemical input, the reactant that is input into the reaction, uh, always comes from atmospheric molecules, CO2, oxygen, water, and nitrogen, and so on. And there is no geological reliance on these resources. It's because everywhere, every corner in the world, we can access this reactant. And by feeding them into an electrolyte that can be operated in a very mild conditions, room temperature, ambient pressure, we can fabricate green chemicals, green fuels, and also we can produce hydrogen as an important energy carrier for energy storage and so on. And of course, these critical device that is making this transformation happen is where our research is really focusing on, the electrolyzer. Our research is actually based on two major thrusts over the past several years. Number one is to develop a catalytic materials. You cannot see the catalyst, but it's housing inside where it can drive the reaction more efficiently and more selectively. But also, we are also focusing on developing new catalytic reactors like these ones to make the process more uh, energy efficient and more practical. So only two representative examples to share with you uh, the importance of both catalytic materials design and the reactor engineering is we know the catalyst is where the reaction is happening, right? The catalyst surface is actually playing a critical role to dissociate the chemical bonds that we feed into the reactor and then form new bonds for the product that we want. For example, in this case, if we convert CO2 to carbon monoxide. And therefore, a lot of reactions may not even happen without a right catalyst. So therefore, for example, um, a few years ago when we started the research of carbon dioxide reduction, we first started with the um, uh, transition metal nanoparticle catalyst, try to reduce the carbon dioxide into valuable chemicals and fuels. But we surprisingly find out that the selectivity is very low. It's actually less than 5% using these type of metal nanoparticles. But our unique contribution to the field is we find out that by dispersing these atoms, these transition metal nanoparticles, all the way disperse them into single atomic site. So these nanoparticle is hundreds of nanometers that actually consist of millions of millions of atoms inside of that. But if we allocate each of the atoms into single atomic site, no direct connections between these two atoms, we can actually improve the reaction selectivity by several orders of magnitude, more than 95%. So this is the magic part of the catalytic materials. By using the same materials, both are nickel, but in different morphology, you can completely change the reaction pathway and activity. And also regarding the reactor, because if you develop materials only, you sometimes cannot see the big picture of when you are trying to implement this material, the catalyst in a more practical environment. This is where the reactor engineering is also important. Because we can see the practical challenges that we're facing with when we are uh, trying to um, scaling up these processes. So in a traditional electrolyzer, we know we have two electrodes. And we have to pass electricity between the two electrodes. Therefore, we always have to have a liquid electrolyte, which is basically a sorting water. We have potassium, we have sodium to conduct electricity. Because you, you cannot directly use DI water, pure water, because which is very resistant. The problem for having a liquid electrolyte in almost mo all of the traditional electrolyzers is when you have your liquid product generated on the surface of the electrode, it will naturally dissolve into a liquid electrolyte. And you will always have to have a downstream product separation process. Because you cannot utilize a product that is in a mixture with sodium, potassium, those impurity ions. And even though the economics are playing very critical role here, as you can see, even though if you're only considering the fabrication cost of these chemicals from CO2 reduction, uh, considering the lower and lower cost of the electricity, actually compared to the existing market price, they are very attractive. But most of these techno-economic analysis are not taking into consideration these downstream separation costs. And unfortunately, if you further add that layer of cost, it won't become economic viable. It becomes 
more expensive than the traditional method and will lose the momentum to continue for the commercialization. Our motivation at that time is very direct. Can we design a reactor that does not, allow, does not need us to do this downstream process, separation process? Can the re a new reactor can directly help us to produce high purity of these liquid fuels without the separation need? So here is the um, new design of a so-called salt electrolyte reactor, where we just simply replace the liquid electrolyte with this type of porous polymer-based solid electrolyte conductors, where we can still maintain very good ion conduction between the two electrodes, but these solid electrolyte particles won't dissolve in water, so they won't contribute any of the impurity ions into our product that is generated in between. And this is a picture of our solid electrolyte in lab. And using that type of concept, as well as the reactor engineering design, we can actually produce high purity of formic acid, high purity of acetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and many other liquid products directly coming from this reactor without any separation needs. So those works are impossible without the talent efforts from our group students. Um, I always want to emphasize that uh, if you give the freedoms of innovation to your students, they always give you return with your surprise. For example, at that time we say, why don't we have a group hoodie? And one of our group students just innovatively designed this hoodie, and it, you know, it includes a lot of the elements of our research. This is a, we call that the cat group, it's short for catalysis, it's a so cute cat. And I'm a cat fan also. Um, and the ear of the cat represent reaction kinetics we always need to overcome using catalyst. And also these are the molecules that we are interested in. And also special thanks to the funding resources that we continue to receive uh, from government and industrial partners. Um, in the end, I want to emphasize that the decarbonization process is not a five year or 10 year project. It's actually a lifetime challenge and lifetime project, especially for our generation. And only by electrifying chemical engineering is not sufficient. That's only contribute one, three percent of the total carbon emission. Uh, by only having all the efforts making together from the whole society, we can return uh, to our gen next generations with a greener and more sustainable Earth. Thank you. <laughs>